No, oh, not on yet. Oh, there we go. Testing, testing. Testing. Everybody want to do a railing? I do, but I think Trevor's got it all under control. All good? Live stream is on. I'm trying to figure out how to work Okay, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for everyone in attendance here today for coming together um, and joining in this exercise on what we as a council would like to see in terms of our meeting schedule, structure. Um, we're going to be having some conversations around committees and um, I just want to first and foremost thank our staff for really working so hard to bring this workshop together. Um, and of course, to my right, Tom Urbaniak for sharing his expertise and, and his really wonderful skill in facilitating conversations and workshops like this. Um, today, I really hope that we all are ready to be engaged. I think Tom has even some writing exercises for us to do throughout this workshop. Um, don't be afraid to ask questions. 
this is really a time for us to explore how we're going to be a really effective council. So I really, I'm excited that we're all here and we're engaged in this. Uh, uh, first, we're gonna have our municipal clerk, Deborah Campbell, um, give us a bit of background on, you know, governance structures and committees in the CBRM and essentially how we got to where we are today. So I'm going to hand it to Deborah and then Tom will lead us through this exercise and conversation. Thank you, Mayor McDougall. And um, as the mayor mentioned, this, uh, will, this section of the workshop will just be a bit of history on how we got to where we are today with the CBRM committee governance structure. And I did provide some background information to all council. Um, it was quite an extensive package of information. These slides is just a brief summary of that. So if anybody has any questions, they can certainly ask um, once I'm completed this, this short presentation. So the current committee structure is the general committee governance structure, and that was approved by council on February 19, 2013, and that was following a committee of the whole system pilot uh, project that we had. The membership on the general committee includes all members of council and is chaired by the mayor. The terms of reference for the general committee is in the RC4 committee's policy. I'll be referencing that a few times uh, this afternoon. That's in your package. Um, that's the one that has most of the terms of reference for our committees. And the empowerment uh, for that committee and the empowerment for council to delegate authority to any committee is in section 23, sub 1, sub C of the MGA, the Municipal Government Act. And on page 33 of the background uh, information is where that section of the act is. Uh, there's a copy of it there. So just a bit of background on going back to amalgamation. So from 1995 to 2000, we had 21 councillors plus the mayor on our council. We had four main standing committees at that time, and there were six council members on each committee. They were the Corporate Services Committee, the Public Services Committee, and that included water utility responsibilities, the Protective Services Committee, which uh, membership was also the Police Commission, uh, that was later separated, um, and the Planning Advisory Committee. And initially when those committees started in 95, they were meeting on a weekly and bi-weekly basis. Um, and mainly they were working on transitional work. They were coming from a former eight municipalities into one. They were working on uh, policy and bylaw development. So there's quite a bit of work involved in those early days. And again, those powers that they had, those committees had, were in the, that committee's policy that I referenced. So uh, subsequent to the, uh, the initial four committees, there was um, the Water Utility did um, form a separate committee from the Public Services Committee. Um, that was around 2004. Basically, the Water Utility was expanding. The service was expanding. And um, the Protective Services, as I noted, was also Police Commission, but later that was separated as a separate body. The Police Commission was a separate body. So from 2000 to 2010, the, um, in, 20, in the year 2000, the council size was reduced to 16 councillors plus the mayor. And the committee size at that time, we still had those four main committees, uh, changed from six council members to eight council members, which was half of the council. And they rotated um, every year just for continuity purposes. The frequency of the meetings decreased uh, basically to a monthly, and that was due to lower volume. And that was because policy and bylaw development had pretty much taken place. They were in, uh, they were in place then. So it was just issues that required uh, council attention of the day but, um, for the areas of responsibility under those committees. So in January of 2010, there was a council request for a staff issue paper on a possibility of, of moving to a committee of the whole system. And the reasoning at the time was that, um, so that all council could be part of all decision making. And at that time, and, and of course we've always struggled with financial issues, but the financial situation at the time in 2010 was that they, all council members wanted to be part of all decision making. So they agreed to go with that pilot, and in September of 2010, council embarked on a committee of the whole pilot project. But at that time, council retained all decision making powers. So. Um, the committee of the whole dealt with issues, all of the issues, and, and then they were all referred to council because they had no decision-making powers because it was a pilot. They were just, uh, I guess, um, seeing what uh, powers they would require under that committee. So in 2012 to 14, so again in 2012, the council uh, size was reduced once again to the current size, which is 12 councillors plus the mayor. Um, at the time, after the pilot project, council felt it was easier to reach consensus with the smaller group and that each member could participate in all matters before the committee. Therefore, in February of 2013, the general committee replaced the committee of the whole pilot 
and that at the same time eliminated those four main committees. Also, there was decision-making power uh, authority delegated to council, uh, by council to the general committee as noted above. So the, the purpose of the general committee, it was not intended to dilute the ultimate power of council by any means, and it wasn't, uh, they, they didn't want that rubber stamp perception that because all of council was on the general committee, they dealt with all the issues, and then two weeks later, the, any issues that require council approval came back. So they didn't want it to be that rubber stamp, um, but they didn't want to re repeat the debate at council as well. So they did find a balance with that for sure. And uh, Bernie White, the former clerk at the time, um, when he did bring his issue paper in 2013, he did note, uh, note and point out that an alternative to a general committee was certainly to hold two council meetings per month. Since it was all members of council on the general committee, it was just they were sitting as a different, as a different assembly. Uh, but the council did decide to go with the general committee format. Uh, another thing that happened in, ten, in 2013, uh, June 2013, was the council discontinued appointment of elected officials to most of the external agencies. And there's a detailed issue paper on that. Again, Bernie White prepared that back in 2013. It starts on page 38 of that package that I referenced that I had sent out to you. There was some reasoning for that change. And again, all of the relevant issue papers are included in the package. So the Fire Emergency Services Committee, uh, that was created by council in August of 2014. And their terms of reference and their mandate is outlined again in that committee policy, that RC4 committee's policy, you have a copy before you. And prior to the general committee, the Fire Services Department reported to the Protective Services Committee. So, and I would note that in 2014, there was an organi organizational review. So there was a review of all departments. Um, there was actually some... Um, uh, uh, elimination of some positions that were deemed, um, I guess it was uh, through attrition. And um, also um, with that review, they looked at uh, some committee responsibilities and the building inspectors and bylaws division had, had formerly be in, been in the fire service department, but they were moved to planning. So now the anything that comes from the, um, the building services, the bylaws group, the appeals and that type of thing go to uh, to general committee and not fire services. The Economic Development Committee. So in January of 2017, the nominating committee had requested a staff issue paper on uh, forming a new Economic Development Committee, but of course, Economic Development was in the forefront. Um, on May 2nd, 2017, the general committee uh, did direct to proceed with a comprehensive review of the municipal planning strategy using a framework of separate meetings of the general committee. And, they were, and that, that meeting was devoted to planning and economic development issues. And the first meeting of the general committee on planning and economic development was May 8th, 2017. Um, I would note that the Economic Development Committee on Planning, the General Committee on Economic Development and Planning did not meet since December of 2018, but there was a reason for that. Um, in early 2019, uh, uh, Planning Director at the time, Malcolm Gillis, advised he had temporary staff shortages in his department and the Economic Development Manager for CBRM position was vacant, so he didn't anticipate any meetings in the coming months of that committee. Um, Malcolm Gillis, the Director Gillis, retired in May of 2019, and he was replaced by Michael Roos. So looking at the work of that committee when Michael Roos came in, um, there was a directive that came out from Mayor Clark on, in September of 2019 advising that Director Roos was working with his staff, he had a number of new staff, and they were assessing the planning and development matters and the requirements for committee work. So um, in April of 2020, uh, council, this um, council approved an RFP, a request for proposals for a comprehensive review of the municipal planning strategy and other planning documents. So um, I would suggest that with respect to this committee, the council can certainly consider what requirements there might be for that type of committee once that review is completed. And I'm sure that uh, Director Roos will bring a report into council and you can deal with it at that time. I just want to provide that background that there was a committee that dealt with that matter, economic development. There were other committees that uh, council had uh, created and um, since 2017, uh, there were, they were listed there in front of you. Um, all of these committees are resourced by the clerk's department and most uh, internal committees are. So the appeal standing committee that was created in June of 2017. 
And prior to that time, the dangerous unsightly premises appeals were heard at the Protective Services and the General Committee. Um, it was determined that given the sensitivities of the issues that were discussed, um, that um, there should be a separate committee and it was all council members and actually we're gonna be having a requirement to have that uh, committee meet again in the near future. Um, so and there's, there's rules and um, terms of reference and mandate for that committee outlined in, that res in the um, RC4 committee's policy as well. Uh, we also formed a charter ad hoc committee and a viability study steering committee, both of which were special purpose committees. And the mandate for the viability study steering committee was completed in August of 2019. We also have a liaison and oversight committee, and that's a requirement for our regional enterprise network, which is through the Cape Breton Partnership. So um, there's council members and staff members appointed to that committee. And soon this council will be required to strike an accessibility committee, and that's in regards to the Nova Scotia Accessibility Act, and you'll be getting reports on that at council in the coming months. And I would note the appeals committee is also the mandate you'll see. They're, they can also deal with appeals under the taxi bylaw and our new uh, tow truck licensing bylaw that was just enacted by council. We are required, uh, council is required to have mandated committees. So as per provincial legislation, council shall appoint members to the board of police commissioners, the audit committee, the heritage advisory committee, and the fences arbitration committee. Council also appoints citizens to the diversity committee in accordance with the CBRM diversity committee governance policy. And that committee was uh, formally called the Affirmative Action Committee. And again, copies of all of that information is included in that uh, package that I had circulated. Just a couple of uh, notes I'd want to make before uh, then I'm, I'll be complete of my uh, presentation. The original staff recommendation in February 2013 was that the general committee meet over two days. and. Um, with, with issues separated by category, which was actually the, the names of those former committees. So issues under corporate services and protective services, they would be one day, and then public services and planning issues the next. And, and that would uh, permit the focusing of agendas for the council members and efficient and effective use of council's time. Also, if there weren't any public services issues, you didn't have to have it listed, of course, or any of the other uh, divisions. Um, so that was the original intent, although we did tend to meet uh, in one day, and I guess it would just be a matter of looking at the agenda and determining if two days were required. And further, um, under the, uh, the four main committees, those four main committees I'd reference structure, uh, it was determined, and this was leading up to the days of governance of the, um, the uh, general committee governance structure, was that once the budget was approved, issues requiring council and committee cons consideration were really reduced, um, and that really resulted in a decreased need to meet. So we had these four committees that would meet the first uh, week of the month usually, and um, many times there wouldn't be, once the budget was passed, especially in the public services area, there wouldn't be really a requirement to meet uh, on a regular basis. So it, it, it was a more efficient use of council's time to have the general committee and just meet on the issues that required council's attention. And that completes my presentation and thank you very much for the opportunity. <laughs> thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, before we move on to the facilitated portion, does anybody have any questions for Deborah Okay, Councilor Gillespie. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor McDougall. Uh, question is, with regards to the mandate uh, that the province issues us for uh, Board of Police Commissioners, Audit Committee, Heritage Advisor Committee, and Fence Arbitration Committee, um, am I to assume that the Fire and Emergency Services Committee is not actually mandated by the province? No, it's not. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any any other questions before we move on to the next portion? There will be lots of opportunity, I'm sure, um, with Professor Urbaniak um, guiding us through this. Um, without more questions, I do want to, again, uh, first extend our gratitude, Tom, for your time and expertise in helping us uh, craft this discussion today. And I will hand it to you. Do a sound check. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, and maybe I'll go here. Um,
thank you very, very much uh, for the invitation. And I just want to res uh, express my respect and admiration for, for your public service, not only on council, but your community leadership before coming to serve on council. I deeply respect your wisdom and experience. And so I see part of my role uh, as to modestly try to reflect back to you your wisdom and experience. I also see as part of my role to help council step back a little bit and just ask the high level questions. What are we trying to achieve? How can our committees, our committee structure, the way we run our committee meetings, help us to achieve what we want to achieve? Okay. I'll start with a, with a very short presentation, just to set the table, be a little bit of an appetizer, and then I'll be posing a few rapid fire questions to you. Uh, so there'll be some on the spot homework, and hopefully this will generate some, some energy and some advice and guidance. Okay, so key questions. What are we trying to achieve? What are you trying to achieve as leaders of our community? Uh, what are committees actually for? Um, let's just step back and examine the purposes of committees. Why do we set them up? Why do we dissolve them? Why do we make some active? Why do we make some less active? Um, what standing and temporary committees do we need? And what doors do we leave open for those we might need in the future? And what actually makes committee work or committee structures effective? Sorry for the small type. I'll go through these, the points, and I think you do have a handout in front of you. So I'm going to propose a way to proceed. Um, I'm going to propose that this be a first step of a short process. Um, so I'll gather some ideas today, some initial guidance from you today. And then I will take back the notes and the comments. And I will commit to you that this week, I will prepare a short memo, again, trying to reflect back to you your wisdom and experience. Tentatively, based on what we discussed today, I'll include a few recommendations in that memo. And then, if you're willing, we can gather again, and we can discuss those recommendations, fine tune them. That's when we'll get into the nitty gritty a little more. Uh, I know that you have a strategic planning, a strategic directions workshop coming up in a couple of weeks. And no doubt, the outcomes of that workshop will have some implications for your committee work and maybe to some extent your committee structure. Uh, so if need be, we can do a little bit more fine tuning after you go through that process. Um, so I'll check in with you if that's an acceptable process, but to start this conversation, I'll, I'll suggest that we proceed in that way. A few steps, but in quick succession. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about the purposes of committees. This is not an exhaustive list. You'll note that at the bottom, there's a bullet point that says other. Again, you have this printout in front of you in case the, the type is too small on the screen. Um, some of these are obvious, maybe some a little bit less obvious. Of course, the committee advises council on governing. A committee does not actually participate in running a department. The MGA is very clear that the chief administrative officer runs the day-to-day -day operations of the municipality and supervises department heads who in turn supervise other staff. So committees are not given a chunk of the staff to supervise, no matter how you organize your committee structure. But committees help you to govern the municipality, to set the strategic directions of the municipality, to set the budget of the municipality, to approve the policies of the municipality, to be able to give voice to the concerns and grievances and aspirations of the residents of the municipality. Of course, committees, if well-functioning, can lighten the council agenda and can maybe allow council to focus on a few of your strategic priorities. Uh, uh, committees can also give key issues some more careful examination so they can act as a kind of focus group. Um, they can highlight strategic priority areas. We'll look at a case study in a moment where a particular council said, okay, we have our strategic directions. Our community has pointed us in certain directions. And to some extent, the committees that we name 
are an echo of those strategic directions because we want to make sure that our community is helping us to keep on the radar those issues that we have identified as priorities. Um, engage citizen talents and expertise. Almost without exception, when we study municipalities and where we identify municipalities as progressive, so this is where they're, they're trying to innovate. Uh, municipalities that have gone through an industrial history and are trying to remake themselves as clean, green, prosperous, post-industrial communities. Those municipalities that are doing that effectively almost always uh, involve citizens on committees, uh, but in a thoughtful way. Because they've essentially come to the conclusion that our resources are limited. We have an amazing staff, yes. Uh, we have amazing people around the council table, yes. But we're financially strained. The tax base is not what we want it to be. Uh, we uh, can't afford to always hire consultants to answer questions for us. But we have skills and creativity and experience in our community. So how are we going to use that? Often on a pro bono basis. And a well-done committee structure can really facilitate that uh, mining of expertise in your community. Um, make disparate geographical communities, diverse cultural communities feel more connected to the process of governance. So committees are about legitimacy as well. When final decisions are taken, it's apparent to the community that they have been discussed, that multiple stakeholders have been involved in those discussions, and that those people reflect the diversity of the community that you're governing. Um, develop leadership expertise within council. So sometimes we see municipalities using committees um, as a way to sort of cultivate leadership. So um, councillors who are asked to chair a committee may develop a little bit of expertise in a particular area, may, without directing staff and departments, come to know staff and departments. Because certainly the MGA is clear about this, that you can get information from different staff, not just from the CAO. Um, so sometimes it's a way of almost like succession planning within the governance of your community, that you're able to give uh, leadership roles to members of council. Uh, democratic deliberation, committees meet in public, municipal committees meet in public, of course, uh, except uh, where they're discussing one of those issues that falls under the allowable categories for in-camera meetings. But essentially, the, um, the, the, the rule is that committees meet in public, and that can be very healthy because the public witnesses uh, the discussion of alternatives and can see that decisions haven't just been taken arbitrarily, but that there was a process leading to those decisions. Of course, as Deborah mentioned, meeting statutory or legal requirements Sometimes you just have to have a committee, or if you do have a committee, it has to have certain functions. And we can talk more about those intricacies a little bit later. And other, other purposes um, that may not be listed there. And if, if anyone comes to mind now for anyone around uh, this table, please, please feel free to shout it out. But that's not an exhaustive list. OK. Okay, so types of uh, municipal committees. Uh, of course, we have standing committees, uh, and other organizations have these types of committees too. Standing committees are, are permanent committees in the sense that they don't have a sunset date written in. Ad hoc committees, which often come under different names, like task forces or working groups, those do have a sunset date. They have a project to take care of or to a study to do. They submit their work, they declare victory, and we move on. Uh, we, citizen advisory committees or boards, um, these could be standing committees as well. So there's some overlap in these categories. Um, but certainly, uh, you are permitted to do that. If you have an issue of concern uh, or a community of concern, you can build a citizen advisory uh, committee around that. Sometimes they're called boards, but they're really committees in the sense that they don't govern something as a board would. Uh, they're still accountable, ultimately, to the council. Um, Section 27 of the MGA talks about community committees. I said community councils here, uh, but the, the legal term is community committees. So in theory, you can determine that a neighborhood, 
um, an area within the regional municipality might benefit from having a community committee. And the MGA talks about some of the things that a community committee might, might look at. Again, uh, it's ultimately accountable to the, the council. And this list doesn't include the external committees and boards to which you make appointments. So we're talking about what committees a municipality could have, what a structure could be, but it's not the only question. Um, once you have committees, of course, you have to determine what are their terms of reference. As we'll see, some communities, some local governments use mandate letters, uh, which are very powerful, have done well. So even if you have a standing committee, which means a committee that's just going to keep going indefinitely until you say stop and change your committee structure, even if you have a standing committee, you could be giving that standing committee an annual mandate letter as the council to say that in the, in the coming year, we really want you to delve into these two or three things and come back to council with, uh, with a report or some recommendations. Okay. Um, training for chairs. So chairs are facilitators and catalysts. Co committees are less formal than the, the council meeting. Um, there is more of a kind of dynamic conversation that can happen in most committee settings. And uh, good chairs, good facilitators are, are indispensable. So maybe my humble recommendation would be, even though this is a council with a lot of community experience, it doesn't hurt to um, provide some um, some training for chairs. And some of the chairs of some of your committees might be citizens. Um, and again, there would be a benefit perhaps in offering some, some training. Um, decisions around meeting frequency and structure of agendas. Uh, do you want to maybe divide up your agendas a little bit so that you're not in marathon sessions? Uh, so that each meeting has two or three items, and then you defer items four, five, and six to a subsequent meeting so that you can come at them fresh. Those are part of the consideration of sort of this early process for you in determining what kinds of committees you want and what they're going to do and how they're going to operate. Okay, so let's look at some examples of smart approaches. Uh, to municipal committees. Okay. Um, I'm going to call these models. That's not to say that one is dramatically different from another, uh, but I'm suggesting here that the cities I'm going to profile have kind of leaned into uh, doing something a little bit differently, maybe than their counterparts. Uh, so Charlottetown. In Charlottetown, we see um, advisory boards and committees that reflect areas of strategic priority. Uh, so there's an arts advisory board consisting mostly of citizens, right, that, and that reports to the council, clear mandate. So the city thought that uh, an area of strategic priority would be continuing to develop the arts. The arts have already put Charlottetown on the map. They thought, okay, um, we can run with that. That's an economic development plus. And how are we going to make sure that we're taking the right decisions and that someone is keeping our feet to the fire as a council? Maybe the Arts Advisory Board can help. Likewise with the Food Council, they wanted to do more work on food security, on local food. Um, they thought that could make their uh, community more sustainable, more livable, improve the quality of life. So let's gather the people who have been thinking about that longer than we have and um, ask them to serve on a food council, which in effect becomes a committee of the council. Okay. Um, likewise, seniors engagement committee, uh, youth engagement committee. Okay. Mississauga model, the city of Mississauga, Ontario. Um, spent a fair bit of time studying this city and its former mayor, um, Hazel McCallion, quite a remarkable career. Um, and Interesting insight here. So Hazel McCallion developed over many years a, a, a reputation as a strong mayor, right? as someone, a, a sort of a no-nonsense leader, gets things done, etc. And one of the um, mechanisms that the council and the, with the mayor championing it adopted to allow the mayor to be effective was to ensure that the mayor would not chair the general committee 
or the second general committee, which in Mississauga was called the Planning and Development Committee. So the chair actually rotated among the councillors from month to month. The mayor was never in the chair, and that allowed the mayor to participate actively in the debate. If you're not in the chair, you actually do have a little bit more birth, a little bit more flexibility. To, you can move motions. You can object to what a previous speaker said or propose an alternative. Sometimes we see people doing that from the chair, but it's a little harder, especially if this is a committee of the whole. And of course, formally, technically, a chair is supposed to maintain a, um, an even-handed neutrality. Um, so that's, that's, that's a possibility to consider. Um, the Edmonton model. Again, Edmonton would, has some of the same standing committees that CBRM has, uh, but Edmonton has another interesting feature that has been with the city for a little over 100 years, and these are the community leagues. So each neighborhood in Edmonton has a community league, and each community league uh, consists of volunteer citizens. They're actually elected at an annual general meeting, and each community league is given 0.8 acres of land by the, the city, and over time, actually, small grants from the city. And they kind of perform the role that the recreation coordinators used to in the CBRM's predecessor municipalities. So sometimes they run little facilities, they uh, run programs for their neighborhood, but they're also consulted on planning issues affecting their neighborhood. Now, all 160 community leagues in Edmonton do not report directly to the council. That's, <coughs> that would be impossible. Uh, but there is an Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues, which the city regards as a partner. Um, and for the most part, that experiment has worked very well in Edmonton. Now, others have tried to copy it, but they've had to modify it to suit their own local circumstances. But the message here is that you can be, you have some statutory requirements, uh, you have some carryover from previous practice, but you can be creative too in how you um, set up your governance structure. Okay. And how about Vaubjik? This is the sister city of the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. So in 2019, an agreement was signed between the two councils. And uh, they are sister cities. Their mayor, uh, Roman Chelemé, was, was here, and uh, staff members of the city of Vaubjik. Coal mining city until the 1990s. The coal mines closed, all of them. They decided that even though there was some possibility of reopening coal or partially, they decided they're finished with that. And they want to remake themselves as a post-industrial, uh, education-oriented, um, strong on the arts, green, clean city. Um, and they've tried to engage their 100,000 people to, to make that happen. Um, and so they set up their committee structure to function kind of as small focus groups to help develop the councillor's expertise uh, in order to strategize and oversee that transition to the post-industrial economy. So the, the budget committee, studies the budget, even if it's not budget time. Um, they, it, it's almost like a little laboratory. Um, same thing with their economic development committee. Um, they're trying to develop expertise. Uh, so different, uh, all counselors can't, all counselors are concerned with all issues. And so the budget is the, the province of the council, the authority of the council. But wouldn't it be nice to really train up a few counselors uh, to really understand how the budget gets developed and what some of the tough considerations are. So that's kind of how they're using their uh, committee structure, in part. Okay. I just want to share with you a couple of examples from outside the municipal world, but that I think are applicable to some extent to the municipal world. Um, the CBU Senate model. So the Senate is the academic governing body of uh, a university, and of course CBU has, has a Senate, and the different constituencies within the university are represented on the Senate, faculty members, the administrations, students, uh, of course. 
And CPU said it um, has actually gotten progressively more effective over the years. Uh, it's almost like learned uh, from year to year. And one of the things that the CBU Senate um, has started doing in the past couple of years especially is um, no longer creating task forces with open-ended timelines or open-ended mandates. Uh, but actually, whenever a task force is created, giving them three or four specific questions to answer. They've got to come back with answers to those three or four specific questions. And they usually have a very short time, maybe two months or three months. Um, sometimes their life might be renewed. They might come back and they might be asked to continue another two or three months and answer, answer one or two more questions or do a little bit more work on one of the questions that they had previously answered. But usually they declare victory. This task force has done what it has been asked to do. There is some follow-up. Some of that can be done by the existing standing committees. And that's where those mandate letters come in. Right? The mandate letters then get written to the standing committee saying, OK, task force A has recommended. Um, for example, there was a task force on, student in, uh, in on academic integrity. Right? It came back with a number of issues and recommendations. And Mandate letter went to the academic committee, which is a standing committee of Senate, saying, OK, the task force wants us to work on these issues. And here are a few we are asking you to work on. Can you come back with the answers this year? Okay. Another interesting feature that the CBU Senate has developed uh, over time is something called the take note debate. So let's use that example. The academic integrity task force does its work. It comes back. Uh, there are some uh, issues and concerns that are identified. There's another task force on academic advising. Same thing, issues and concerns identified. We don't have to react to all of the recommendations right away. Right? Nor do we want to lose the recommendations either. So often the first step of the Senate, and this is the, the comparable body would be the council here, is to have a take note debate. We've just heard the presentation. We've read the report. The task force has done its work. Uh, now, let's get your insight. Does this resonate with your experience? Does this resonate with the constituencies that you represent? And we're going to take notes. We're going to take detailed notes based on what we hear in this debate. Then we'll come back the next time and start divvying up the work as a result of the recommendations that have come from the task force. So take note debate is a nice tool. Um, and actually, that was borrowed from Parliament, believe it or not, where they've started doing that more often, where sometimes the government actually genuinely wants to hear what members of Parliament have to say, and they'll do a take note debate. Okay. And just a final uh, case study, the National Trust for Canada. Um, some folks are familiar with it because it's done work in this community. This is the uh, National Charity for Historic Places. Um, I was honored to serve as, as chair for a few years of the National Trust for Canada. And the use of the mandate letters, um, that has been a powerful tool. So the National Trust did a strategic plan, crisp, short, uh, five strategic directions. It was very clear that it was going down this fork in the road and not that fork in the road. That's the purpose of strategic directions. And then we want to translate those strategic directions into deliverables. Our committees can help us do that, but we're going to issue mandate letters, one page, few points to each committee, uh, explaining what we want them to come back with this year. Okay, so the committees are not just transacting the business that staff sends up. They're also helping the board in this case with the strategic work of governing the organization. OK, so here I probably will refer you to the handout, which I think is a little bit more visible than the screen. But common council and committee problems, I don't think this is a revelation for, for anyone here, just based on your extensive community leadership experience. We start running into problems where we have unclear mandate, right? no clear goals, no sense of momentum from one meeting to the next, long 
or disorganized meetings, the marathon meetings, right? Take a break. Uh, at very least, uh, partway through, after you know an hour and a half or two hours. Um, and this is no critique of the council, but uh, certainly those who are veteran councillors can attest to uh, you know four or five hour meetings that have happened without a break. Uh, and you, as an observer, you can tell that uh, as uh, dedicated and knowledgeable as the members are, um, a little bit of crankiness is setting in. Um, so that's, that's something to be very, very cautious about. Um, one or two people doing all the talking, personal conflicts, grandstanding. Um, members don't do their homework. Uh, so, and this is not a reference to council, it's just a reference to organizations generally, uh, where their material has been prepared, where we're asking people to come ready to address an issue, and they have only the foggiest idea about what they're being asked to address. Uh, committees that meet for the sake of meeting, they've outlived their usefulness, maybe we should have transferred their work somewhere else, but we're continuing to keep them on the roster. Um, failure to tap into community expertise, just sort of keeping it inside, um, that's a very, very common problem. Uh, the failure to meet, right, here's the chair, it has to be a little bit of a prompt. The chair is not simply taking the chair when staff call a meeting. Um, the chair does have to assume a little bit of ownership for, for facilitating this, this committee and um, just a little bit of um, accountability for its effectiveness. Okay. So, um, I've just shared a few um, these sort of introductory remarks, a few case studies really briefly. I'll ask if there are any questions at this point before I ask you a question. Or if there's anything that you'd like me to repeat. I, I always say to my students, don't hesitate to interrupt either and um, ask for something to be repeated or a different example to be used. Always happy to do that. Tom? Yes, I yes, wonder, Amanda. So we're, we're talking quite a bit here about <coughs> committees, um, but how are we going to incorporate the conversation around our, our regional council meeting too? Because I, I really want that structure to be, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, a part of this conversation. So when you talk about things like the marathon meeting, I'm not sure. <laughs> anybody who was on council before would disagree that perhaps those are sometimes exhausting experiences and how can we look at that as well and say how can we how can we focus it do we have to split up our regional council meeting uh, like I just want, I don't want to miss an opportunity to co have a conversation about that as well, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. That, and that point is well taken. I think some of the guidance that's uh, going to come forward in the next few minutes uh, in response to these questions will affect the council meetings themselves to some degree. Um, the way you structure your committees uh, and the way they report will affect your council meetings because not every committee has to report directly to the council. Uh, you could have a committee reporting to a general committee. You could have a committee reporting to a standing committee. Uh, you could have one of your citizen advisory boards um, reporting to one of your standing committees. Uh, so I'm really conscious of that too, sort of the, the desire to uh, free up the council meetings themselves to some extent so that you can focus on the strategic business uh, of the municipality. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I feel, and I don't want to speak for anybody else on council, but perhaps that is what we're looking for today, then how do we take things out of that agenda that can get really, really long for regional council and focus more? And, and maybe, I, I don't know how council members feel here today, but maybe we do meet more frequently for shorter periods of time, but focused on different issues. And you can help guide us to how do we then take the information from those more focused sessions into a council setting. So just, does that make sense, Tom? Absolutely, okay. absolutely, Great. yes. And actually, I'll relate it to one of the case studies. Okay, so let's have a look at this one. Okay, the, the Mississauga model. Um, what they did was, um, their planning and development committee uh, was uh, a committee of the whole. Um, 
I don't want to get too caught up in the weeds just yet, but if you were to do something like that in uh, CBRM, you do have something in the Municipal Government Act that talks about a planning advisory committee having citizen members, so it couldn't quite be a committee of the whole. I think that's section 200 of the Municipal Government Act. We won't worry about that but, uh, at this point, but they had their planning and development committee, which is committee of the whole. Then they had their general committee, which is the other committee of the whole. Um, committee of the whole, not in the legal sense. I'm just looking at Deborah there. Like a committee of the whole just in the sense that you have the mayor and all the councillors who are on it, okay? Uh, and then you have council itself, of course. Uh, so virtually every other committee, whether it's a citizen advisory board, where it's their heritage committee, their traffic safety council, um, their environmental advisory committee, uh, virtually everything else reported to one of those two committees, planning and development and general committee, okay? And then the council meeting, you would still get the reports of the planning and development of the general committee, but they would almost sort of ratify most things um, quickly because they had already gone through a, a normal deliberation. Sometimes they would stop and revisit something. It may have been particularly controversial, or in the meantime, they've learned a little bit more that would cause them to revisit something that they did at general committee, even though they were all there, uh, or at the planning and development committee. You do have the authority under the MGA, and you've used this, to um, actually delegate power to a general committee. So it, what a general committee does, um, doesn't all have to come up to council. So that is an option for you. Uh, what they did, though, is they still sent them up as recommendations. Usually they would just approve them in, in a quick swoop and focus on a few things that were giving them trouble. Right? And then they would have the council meeting available for some other things. Key presentations that they wanted the general public to um, see or participate in, um, or uh, a take note debate on sort of a high level problem that the community was facing. Okay. So are there any other questions before we go on to questions that I would like to uh, humbly pose to you? No, but I can expand on, uh, if, if I may, uh, with, sure. uh, what go ahead, uh, James. the mayor was saying. Uh, uh, I found uh, in our um, only uh, uh, council meetings to date, they were, they were extensive. Uh, you know, so there seemed to be a, a lot of uh, material crammed into, uh, you know, so uh, I'm really enjoying this presentation to, to see if we can uh, streamline that uh, uh, agenda, which would, of course, uh, lessen the uh, um, extensive of council meetings as well. Yeah, I'm hearing you loudly and clearly. Uh, thanks. Thanks. I think I saw a question there. Yeah, Gordon? Yes. Um, in uh, the examples you used, uh, Tom, um, were any of these uh, um, these examples uh, on a regional government model uh, similar to the way the CBRM is structured as a community of communities, and were the results presented as a as a community, like as a regional um, decision making? Is like <clears throat> because each of each of us have different communities that we come from, and everybody has their own ideas and what they, the wants and takes that they want for each of their communities, kind of. Speaking of the microphone. Oh, come closer. There you go. We can hear you. I never needed a mic before. <laughs> yeah, so just kind of like wondering, like, any examples, were those uh, regional governance models, or were they like strictly, like, I see Edmonton. Edmonton is a city, uh, right? And it's just Edmonton. It's not North Sydney, you know, Lewisburg, in that kind of a structure. So in the committee model and, and how those um, things are brought back to council, are, are they, like, how are they brought forth so that it's uh, it's laid out so that it's all, it encompasses all of the CBRM, say? Right, okay, this is a good question. So um, Edmonton, um, um, yes, is sort of Edmonton is a contiguous urban area, um, but a city of very distinctive neighborhoods. So actually they have these community leagues because uh, they found sort of a diversity among their neighborhoods um, and they, they wanted to ensure that these neighborhoods have a voice. Uh, Mississauga is the product of an amalgamation, um, similar to uh, CBRM. 
Um, and so there were actually, there were three predecessor municipalities, but then one of those had predecessor municipalities uh, also. And it was a forced amalgamation. It was opposed by um, most of the uh, sort of constituent communities initially. Um, so kind of melding that together was a little bit of a challenge for sure. Uh, doesn't have the same land area, obviously, as uh, CBRM. CBRM has 2,400 square kilometers. Mississauga has about 800 square kilometers. Yeah, yeah, early. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to touch. Just you mentioned about chair training earlier on, and I'm thinking of it as we look at this slide, where um, council would take turns, you know, uh, chairing the meetings. As far as chair training goes, and I just wonder because, and my apologies. My apologies, James, for the little laugh that I did because the last two meetings were extensive, but nothing like the 11.30, quarter to midnight that we have put so many of those in. And I, I make the jokes, but it's very difficult and I have no problem saying it. When I sit at that seat at 6 p.m., I have one mindset and I'm excited about the agenda, but when it comes to the last item or the second last item and it's 11 o'clock at night and I haven't had a break and I, you know, I'm rushing to the washroom or I, I'm just tired, I'm hungry, I'm not making the same decision. Like, I'm not putting enough, if I'm against it, I'm not putting enough effort in it. If I'm for it, I'm not putting enough effort into it. So it's very, it's, it's you know, it's, it's not good for council or the CBRM. But in regards to that, and here I am, the point I'm gonna make as I blabber on forever, is with the chair training or extended to council training, we're all voted in by people. They love to see our names in the paper. They love to hear that our voices are there. If we sit quietly, I have literally gotten emails the next day, like, were you not feeling good yesterday, Erlene? I didn't hear you speak very much. Well, you didn't hear me speak because I had nothing to contribute. It was already said. But it's an expectation that people seem to have. But when you have a council of 12 people and the mayor 13 and staff, and everyone gets five minutes and seven minutes, well, if we all utilize that and we have 10 items, we have no choice but to go for this extremely long meeting that nine out of 10 times, and I'm guilty of it as well, all I'm doing is pressing my button and coming here and saying, you know what, um, I agree with Councillor Perouche and repeating what he said. Like, is there a way that we can train ourselves or that the chair can possibly step in to say, okay, you know, appreciate it, but Erlene, do you have anything else that you wanna add? Because that was discussed already. Like to kind of keep a movement as opposed to just allowing the grandstanding to continue because we've all done it. I don't know a counselor yet that have not done it, that I haven't sat back and was like, oh God, here we go again. And they've done it to me. So like, I'm just, what, how can we be pre preventative on that? Right, okay, this is, this is a great question. Um, so uh, one strategy uh, is, uh, you had said 10 items. Uh, well, maybe you only deal with three uh, and then you meet more frequently. Um, so the example I was just sort of starting to talk about with the, uh, the Mississauga and the Planning and Development Committee General Committee, Mondays the planning, every second Monday the Planning and Development Committee would meet. Every second Wednesday the General Committee would meet. And on the other Wednesday the Council would meet. Um, and that, that actually did give them a bit of a chance to cut up those agendas a little bit. Uh, because this is not our one and only meeting of the month or even for two months. And so we're not trying to just cram everything in just to say that we've passed the motions. Um, Tara, if I may. Sure. Yeah, you, you want to jump in, Steve? Yeah. yeah. Uh, from my experience being a chair of a former entity, if we don't change the role of the chair in terms of what the, what, what the purpose of the meeting is, or to cut off somebody, don't take it personal. But if you're repeating somebody, I think that's the role of your chair to pinpoint that and say, that's already been said, sorry, uh, you lost your time. But if we don't change the rules of the game, you could have 10 meetings, you're still doing the same thing right. over and over and over. Right. We need to change the actual, what we're doing here and the purpose of it and have rules in place. Right. And if you start taking things personal, that, that'll never work. But your chair has a responsibility, enforce it, hold people accountable, and I think if we do that, the people will see the difference in the length of the meeting and we're getting things done. And you're right, people expect you to say something, but I'm not gonna speak for the sake of speaking. I didn't get elected to get reelected, so I don't feel encompassed <coughs> by myself to speak on every issue. Right. If, that's, right. if we all take that course of action, 
then I think our meetings will expedite itself. Right. So the chair enforces your standing absolutely. rules. You can change those standing rules. You absolutely can give more power to the chair if that is the decision of the council. Um, another advantage you have now is that you, you're having committee meetings that are um, sort of televised. People can watch them so they can see your councillors participating in those committee meetings. I mean, previously, in the not too distant past, the only sort of televised opportunity was you, were usually those council meetings. So if a councillor worked hard at committee, they still wanted to have their soapbox at the council to sort of almost legitimate the work that they did at the committee. I think there's a little bit less pressure uh, for, that, for that now. Um, also, in the committee setting, the committee chair has uh, a little bit more scope as a facilitator because the committees are less formal. And so there's a, a good committee chair will say, okay, does anyone have a, a point that we haven't heard before? Um, or a good committee chair even tries to say, okay, actually, I'm sensing an agreement in this room. I just wanted to synthesize what I've heard. So the committee chair is listening and saying, would, would there be any objection to proceeding this way based on what I've heard? You can really move a meeting along if you have that skill. Yeah, Amanda? Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Tom. Um, I just want to add in one point before we get um, too excited about having all kinds of extra meetings, committees, and what have you. And I think we do have to be conscious around the idea of resources. So what does this do if we do increase the amount of times that we're meeting? What is that going to do to our municipal clerk's office, for example? Um, there are the same amount of staff members today that there will be tomorrow. So, right, right. you know, in the in the history of CBRM and how we've come to be where we are, we've actually lost a position in that office that was the deputy clerk. So, if we're going to, if we're actually going to do this and, and spread out our meetings and focus more and really revamp our committee structure, we have to be conscious of what kind of impact this is going to have on our resources in-house, and that being our staff members. So just a little heads up as we go into budget. Point well taken, yes. Okay, so I'd like to ask a, a question to, to everyone around uh, this horseshoe. Um, and I'm going to pause for three minutes. Uh, in, okay, um, sorry, um, Steve? Yeah, I have just a question. Sure. Um, when it comes to Amanda's point, I agree with that, but, uh, I think one of the issues that we also have at council is when we have our council meetings and we have our presentations. Sometimes there's three presentations and they take up a lot of time because there's a lot of Q&A. Mm -hmm. I would like to see one presentation at each council meeting and no more than one. Any other presentation can happen at the general if there's need for that as well. Also when we have citizens that come in to speak regarding an issue that's on council, a citizen should be given a time frame just like we are. If we allow a, a citizen or a presentation to come in f and, and they present for 25 or 30 minutes, they can eat up an awful lot of time just with the presentation. Any presentation can be kept down to 10 to 15 minutes, I think. And any issue that a, a citizen has either for or against a vote should really be done in five, less than five minutes. If I could add something, that's something we could potentially think about throughout these discussions. Perhaps each month we offer a day, an evening, that is dedicated towards community presentations. It could be something completely outside. Is that possible, do you think, in the scope of the MGA and what we're allowed to do? Yeah, yeah. Instead of having it at a council meeting, per se, we have, you know, the third Thursday of each month is community presentations and delegations. And, and, and we offer an entire session towards that type of activity. Yeah, yeah we, it's possible. Yeah. You and I had, had discussed that at, uh, one other time too, which I, I, I just think is great. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So here's a question I have uh, for you. I'm going to pause for three minutes um, to just allow you to uh, to write down a few points uh, on uh, one of the uh, blank pieces of paper in front of you. Um, three to five points. Three minutes. How will the CBRM be different in four years, or how would you like it to be different in four years because of council's leadership? No doubt you've, in one form or another, given this a lot of thought in offering as a candidate uh, in your early days on council. So just, uh, just blue sky a little bit, four years out, how is the CBRM different because of the leadership of this council? So I'll pause for three minutes 
and then we'll do a little bit of rapid fire discussion. One more minute. Twenty seconds. Okay, so I'm going to go around the horseshoe and just give me one point, one point from your list, and then we can uh, just check in with everybody to determine if anything was missing that you had. Uh, so just for now, one point, and we'll start with Glenn. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> no pressure, Glenn. Baptism by fire once again. Uh, we'll start on the other side next time. Yeah. <laughs> just uh, uh, together, like our collective visions, what we have, what we want to see, the municipality, hopefully we can kind of work together in the four years as a, as a fresh council with a clean slate just to see what, uh, what we can come up with, basically. Let our opportunities hopefully get to play out what our visions are. Okay, so even just being able to de uh, define a consolidated exactly. vision. Okay, yeah. okay, great. Thanks, Glenn. And Steve? Uh, I won't say it better. I'll say a good working relationship with our other stakeholders, including the province, for example. Okay, good working relationship with other stakeholders, including the province. James? I'd like to see a, uh, a limited agenda items for council meetings and to uh, devote to time sensitive uh, um, areas for sure. Um, but but it, it's, it's to do with the uh, uh, agenda for the uh, council. And so set, uh, when we set specific goals and if any of those are uh, included in the uh, agenda, those are the ones that we want to focus on. 
Okay, uh, thanks. And as we continue our, our tour of the table, um, your uh, input does not have to be limited to uh, committees or governance structures or anything like that. Just the CBRM as a community, uh, as a great community, how is it going to be different because of your leadership um, in four years? Uh, Kenny, one point? Well, I'm just hoping uh, infrastructure, we can improve on that and job opportunity for the whole community. Okay, CBRM. great. Infrastructure and job opportunities, Darren? Um, I'm hoping that we can uh, have some more collaboration with the tourism industry. Uh, we are voted the number one uh, island in the world. I think we should really, uh, you okay. know, take that by the horns and proceed with that as much as we can. All right. Okay. So optimize our tourism potential. Great, Lauren. I'm hoping that we have an engaged uh, community after this uh, four years that they they understand what CBRM is. Uh, the role of CBRM and their role as community. Great, an engaged community, yeah. yeah. Uh, in sort of political science, we sort of use the term civil society. Civil um, society, yeah, I like it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that's sort of everything that's not government, um, but good government depends on it, right? An act of citizenry. Yeah. yeah, Amanda? I would like to see um, us as a council conduct our own yearly reporting and almost a reflection on what we've done, what, we, what we've missed out on, and, and keep that whole strategic planning idea um, as a living document and be able to revise that accordingly. Okay, so like a counter, a culture of introspection, um, of sort of collective appraisal. We're always, we're learning, we're doing better. Okay, great. Um, go to Gordon. Um, and what I have too is uh, I'd like to see more community engagement and being able to get them involved in in the things that our communities need, needs. Uh, we need to be, you know, people that are going to step out to sit on these kind of committees and form these groups to recognize that we have child poverty, we have a housing issue, we have a drug addiction problem, and those are the things that I hope to see in four years that our communities are starting to step up and recognize these. And hopefully, we're at a point putting <clears throat> putting some kind of strategic plans in place to be able to, to tackle these issues, even though they're provincial issues, but we are the grassroots and I think we need to be part of it. Right, so where we have these grassroots crises to sort of move from hopelessness to efficacy, like we can do something about this. Absolutely. Yeah, great, okay, yeah, thanks Gordon. Erlene? Uh, thank you and thanks Gordon because that is, there's an education piece, there's a lot of residents that don't realize that CBRM and all its initiatives aren't done by this council in particular, but it is a collective between the residents and staff and the municipality. But to that more specifically, I'm hoping in four years from now that we have um, just the low hanging fruit, the, the cleaner, more responsible and healthier communities that we all start to take pride in where we live instead of pointing fingers and expecting somebody else to come along. So just beautification, pride and, and you know, clean streets and smiling neighbors. Ah, oh, interesting, okay. So low-hanging fruit, this is an interesting concept. Uh, and a lot of municipalities have really um, focused on that. Um, especially where there have been economic downturns. They've said, okay, we're just where, where there are walls, we won't push to, I mean, we'll push, but we'll go where there are no walls uh, in the way. Uh, so an interesting example, uh, of course, everybody knows the name Pete Buttigieg. Uh, he was a candidate for president or for the Democratic nomination, but he was mayor of South Bend, Indiana, which was a sort of struggling industrial, post-industrial city. And that's exactly what he did. He said, okay, uh, we, we need to see visible progress. So he said, a thousand buildings in a thousand days. These derelict buildings are either fixed up or demolished, a thousand of them in a thousand days. And at first, uh, halfway through, he was panicking, but he actually met the goal because he, he used the soft power of the mayor, of the council, to mobilize the community behind that idea. People just kept hearing that over and over. It's this refrain. It almost became like a benchmark of achievement. And when they achieved it, can you imagine how empowering that is? Wow, we can actually get a handle on one of our problems. Yeah, yeah great. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Rulene. And we'll go to Steve. Uh, I, I focused less on the emotional stuff, and I guess more on the numbers, I would like to see us less in debt. We carry over $70 million in debt. When we amalgamated, we were 50. 25 years ago, we're not getting any better at it. Okay, so reduce the debt. Yep. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Steve. And Eldon? Uh, thanks very much, Tom. I guess I, I look at the question, and I, I look at the second word, will, and uh, truly believe that we will have a better tax base, and I think that's the answer to all of our problems, I guess. At the end of the day, we have to run our municipality on money, and the only 
way we can increase that is through growth. Uh, and through growth, you'll have a better tax base. And we will have that. Uh, we will have opportunities that we see in the downtown core where we will have more residential living and we will have more business opportunities. We see that happening already. Uh, we see buildings that uh, have been vacant for two decades or more, mm -hmm. uh, very dilapidated. Uh, and uh, those buildings uh, have been purchased and will be redone and we'll be back on the, tax roll in a, on the tax roll in a proper manner as opposed to the derelict condition they're in. So it's automatically going to put confidence into the community with that built up confidence. We always see that with the Marconi campus and in particular uh, in reference, I guess, to last council, uh, we put in place the incremental tax program, which uh, is a big help to, to businesses when they're making improvements. So we will see that happen in the next four years and that will help to bring, I think, some of the changes to some other concerns that are raised, so. Right, so you, you will expand the tax base and you'll use whatever levers you can muster to try to make that happen, okay. Okay, Tom, excellent. I, I just want to add one more thing, and, and sure. uh, just as as Gordon brought up some of the issues that uh, that plague our municipality, that unfortunately fall under provincial uh, uh, types of stuff. Uh, I, I would also like to see us more focused on our core responsibilities as a municipality and what the province has asked us to do. Uh, I know that's not the same as, uh, as as what Gordon had said, but maybe the opportunity is there for a dialogue. Okay. So focused on core responsibilities, um, uh, and and there is a reconciliation. Uh, those two ideas can be reconciled. You mm -hmm. focus on your core responsibilities and you do them darn well, uh, and then you realize how your core responsibilities impact the quality of life, broad broadly speaking, of your citizens. Uh, and also you use your democratic legitimacy to advocate. Right? You're the leaders of the community, um, you're the recognized leaders of the community, and that voice carries weight. Uh, and especially if you're doing well on your core responsibilities, you're taken very seriously when you uh, raise the concerns, the grievances, uh, the legitimate grievances of the residents who are suffering in our communities. Thank you. Okay, okay, these are great points. Now, we've done a little bit of a tour of the table. Okay, I Glenn just, has an additional point. Yeah, I just got a text message from uh, Searle, who's at work, which is why he's okay. not here, and yeah. he just wanted to chime in. He said, real progress, not just good press. Real progress, not, not just, just good, good press. press. Do okay. we ever actually get good press? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So we've heard, uh, we've heard uh, the points that people made from the initial round. Are there any other points that are on your sheets that just weren't mentioned? I got one. Okay, we're going to Steve. And this is more of an education thing. There's a real difference living in, my district is rural, versus some others are urban. There's a whole different philosophy when it thinks of what you could or deserve to get from CBRM as far as support. There's an education piece where people don't understand why they don't get certain things for their taxes that they pay. I hear it every day, and I'm sure the city councillors hear a different thing. But I think there's an education piece, not only for our residents, but for our council members themselves, in terms of what our real and true expectations are in the next four years, representing a rural district versus an urban one, because there are some major differences. And, and our policies, and I have, I've only been exposed to some so far, some of our policies are so outdated, and I know that's why we're reviewing them, that they don't reflect realities of today. And I hear that at the door, and I'm sure everybody hears it as well. So I think I'd love to see some sort of education in terms of tell people what we actually do, what we're responsible for. I get people in my districts are calling me because of a road that from a municipal standpoint, we don't control, we don't maintain, we don't spend any money on, but they don't understand that. They still call their counselor. And I'm sure the city councilors get the same thing, now, which they are responsible. So there are a lot of differences in what our responsibilities are as elected officials. Okay, so some sort of mutual understanding of what are the expectations, what are the legitimate expectations mm -hmm. of the council? And that involves uh, education, but that involves dialogue too. Oh, yeah, urban and rural residents and so on. Okay, okay, that's a great point. So anything else that, uh, anything else that's uh, really sort of compelling to you that hasn't been mentioned yet? Gordon. Transparency, Tom. Transparency. Absolutely. Right? We gotta be open. You'll have a reputation for transparency. We gotta tell people what's going on here and at our tables. And when we get there, we'll have their trust and they'll see that we're working for them, not right. working against them, right. for ourselves. Right, <clears throat> okay, well said, well said. 
All right. Anything else, uh, Erlene? And the key word in this one is effective communication between council and staff or city hall, as you mentioned it, to the communities, which kind of ties in what Steve had said as well. There is education pieces on both sides. And when I say effective, we can have community reach outs, but we need to be very careful that we don't always open it up to the same handful of individuals with the same types. How do you get effective communication from your residents to us without right. it being overtaken by a particular, right. you know, because those who are strong are strong. Right. I know because I've mouthed off many times over the years over certain situations and you can keep pushing that to the forefront where someone beside me could have very legitimate concerns about something totally different and docile, right. but they're not getting their voice forward because I'm dominating it. So right. I don't know how to effectively do that. And I've thought about that many times based on if anybody who's not current council look back and seen when we have communities uh, people come up from the community it's they're usually very i don't know very pretentious issues and it's one side or the other and it's it just the discussion's not there you right. know so i just don't know how to make value in that right right but i'd love to see that by the end of this four years that we have a very effective means so like a culture of healthy respectful inclusive public participation conversation with, and that's an art yeah. you don't yeah, just exactly. put microphones in the middle of the room uh, and intimidate most of the people who are in that room um, so that that's that's one of these sort of learning processes too yeah Amanda so this is a little more kind of bringing it back home but I, I think by the end of four years, it's also important for us as members of the council to understand what our roles are as well in terms of what we should be doing. You know, the fact that we do not tell staff what to do. We have a CAO who is in charge of the day to day. All of that kind of basic understanding of our roles needs to be, you know, almost we need a refresher on a regular basis because it's really easy to kind of you know, when you're in the midst of a, a storm, for example, to start calling up public works folks and telling them what to do, that's not how we do things. And we have to really understand what our roles are as counselors. So, um, yeah, I think that's an important piece of the education as well. Right, right. Uh, excellent point. So an understanding and a reminder and a reflection on what are the roles of counselors and how well are we doing in uh, actually fulfilling those roles. How well are you doing? But this is a conversation you would have. And uh, a, a healthy council is able to have that conversation, um, either through a retreat, a, a workshop, uh, which is still transparent to the public. Um, but you can have a conversation similar to what you're having here. OK, okay great. So I have another question. Um, if you could just save that sheet, um, that would be uh, really uh, uh, helpful. I'll collect the sheets later because these will guide the writing of the memo that I have uh, promised to do for you this week. Um, so I'll be reading those, those sheets carefully. Um, and ultimately, I'll ask also for you to put your names on the sheets just in case I needed to clarify something with someone or um, just ask you to elaborate a little bit. Uh, that would be appreciated to just have a name on the sheet. Okay. So let's look at this uh, second question. This is really going to help me. Okay. I'd like to ask you to reflect on a great committee you served on for any organization. A great, could be a board, it could be a, a committee, a council. I'm just using the term committee broadly here. A great committee you served on for any organization. And what made it great? What made it a satisfying experience for you? Okay. So in a moment, of, let's say another three minutes, um, I'll ask you to briefly share that with me.
Let's give it one more minute. And again, I will collect these notes. Um, so um, if, if you're able just to make it as clear as possible in point form, that would be, that would be appreciated. Just a heads up that we'll start on the other end of the horseshoe this time in a, in a few seconds. Um, Ellen, I see you still writing. I, I wonder if I could uh, kindly uh, turn to you anyway and just ask uh, if you could share uh, briefly an, an experience, a positive experience you had serving on a committee. Certainly. Um, I guess we, we serve on many different committees. Uh, I chose the uh, Charlotte Street Redevelopment Steering Committee, uh, which is still currently in place, so we're st still a work in progress. Uh, and, and the reason I chose that is the collaboration of the various different uh, groups, organizations uh, that come together around the table to try to build uh, a plan for the betterment of our community at large. Uh, the challenges that come from that uh, discussion, the opportunities that come from those discussions, uh, and I guess uh, to sum it up, not giving up on the big picture and making sure that our community gets the best product that we deserve. Great. So that's where I would leave it at that. Okay, thanks, Elliot. Thank you. Steve? I guess for me it was the IWK Pediatric Cardiology Clinic held here as a satellite in Sydney. It had been going on for about 36 years. When I took over as chair, it was in debt. Um, within 24 to 36 months, we were able to bring all of the players together, the Nova Scotia Nurses Union, the IWK, uh, Doctors Association, the Regional Hospital Foundation, and the Qantas Club of Sydney. And then now it's continued, it's flourished, but it took bringing all the players together to sit down and go over what the needs were, what the community needed, and what we were expected to do. Right. Just a quick follow-up. So how did you bring the players together? Was it, uh, were you speaking with them one, one at a time? Did you yes. facilitate a session with them all in the same place? Brought, uh, I went to visit them individually, sit okay. down and go over. And That's the interesting thing about it is the, the clinic was going on for 36 years before I took it over, and it was just running on its own, and nobody was paying attention to it. Everybody assumed everybody else was paying for it. But what was happening was the community was paying for it, and uh, it wasn't running effectively. So once the individual uh, groups that were all included found out this, then they started working together again. I assume they did at the beginning, but after a while, like anything we do, folks, we do it for a long period of time. We just assume it's going to continue. Right. Right. Yeah, this is just a good moment for me to throw in a tidbit. So like, one option you have, regardless of your structure, is that uh, you can have facilitated sessions um, with, with different players present, um, if there's an issue you're trying to resolve. Uh, you can even have recourse to special advisors, almost like committees of one, uh, where you give someone a clear task to go and uh, sort of bring back information on what the different interests are, how deep the concerns or differences are on a particular issue. That is, that's absolutely an option. That's a great way of using community expertise as well. Okay, yeah, thanks, Steve. And we'll go to Erlene. Okay, um, mine would be Northside the Lakes, the Community Health Board. And the reasons for it is it's a small, but it's a very dedicated budget. Right. Um, there's a wealth of diverse knowledge and backgrounds. It's a mixture of all residents. 
Um, it's a very dependable schedule. The meetings are kept on time. You know that it's the first Wednesday of the month. You know that it's two hours, and it's very it's kept diligently to that, which is appreciated. Um, it's just overall a really feel-good committee. You know what your purpose is there is just to help benefit the general health of your community, not necessarily individuals, but in regards to the overall health, like transportation and you know parks and air and community services and groups and exercise and engagement. Um, quick to see um, the benefits in immediate areas when we do work together and it's such an extensive network of grassroots community groups that you get to learn about and most of all it's the flow of information. It's a small group but on top of that, we have ties with the Nova Scotia Health Authority, which is constantly giving updates. The chairs of all the different health boards within the region and Nova Scotia as a whole, they get together every three months and all that information comes down. So it's very structured and it's very, you know, it's, it's continuous. It's a constant learning right. program with immediate benefit, so okay. it's wonderful. Oh, great insights, so structured, consistent, you know what your time commitment is, you know how long the meetings are. Okay, that's great insights. Uh, Gordon? Uh, for me, it was uh, when I sat and chaired the uh, Nova Scotia Federation Labor Occupational Health and Safety Work with the Compensation Board Committee. Um, <clears throat> some of the legislations that were brought forth through that committee, um, one of them being the West Ray Act, and then no worker should should not go home. <clears throat> That's, you know, along with the, you know, working with the WCB players in the province of Nova Scotia to bring PTSD legislation to the Workman's Compensation Board, uh, those kind of things, and they're fulfilling because, you know, it's worker-related. It's it's uh, it's about the safety of, of people and, and what their obligations are when they do go to work, and, you know, uh, they don't have to be, they don't have to work in unsafe conditions and, you know, those kind of, those kind of processes. And it was also, you know, and these were pretty structured committees. Uh, we met uh, three times a year. Um, there, were, you know, there were set dates. Um, the chair was appointed, and you know, and, and in those committees, the chair got to engage as well as the members of the committee. So it was a very fulfilling committee, and and one I, I really enjoyed. Okay, so there are a lot of good tidbits there. Uh, one, one I'll sort of tease out though is uh, I sense the empathy. Right? There's just a sense that we're doing something that's having a direct impact on, on people, on our neighbors, and we haven't lost sight of that. That's, that's great. Yeah. Uh, Amanda? So I'm still very new to this board, but I've, I've, I'm a few meetings into the Cape Breton Community Housing Association Board, and what I'm noticing very quickly is the, well, and I, I think this speaks to the way last comment, the way in which everybody understands their role and what their purpose is for that board. I also really appreciate the combination of folks who have been on the board for quite a, quite a while and have a good um, kind of historic knowledge of the organization, but they actively seek out new board participants as well. So there's that good, healthy um, turnover. The other piece that I really, um, I noticed very quickly was how much this board values and respects the opinions and the experiences of staff to report to this board so we can make good decisions. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just a really well-functioning board. Everybody knows their, their roles, they know what is expected of them, and again, that value is placed on the expertise that, that is needed for good decision making. Oh, excellent points, yes. Uh, respect for staff, the, the clarity, excellent. And the other points you mentioned, okay. Uh, Lauren? Yeah, for me, I guess it, it will be no surprise uh, for, for people around the table that uh, I've seen the board that I was on, it was the Cape Breton Victoria Regional School Board, which I chaired. Um, and I think the reason that board functioned well is there was one goal, and the goal was to deliver the best education possible for the students entrusted in our care. While, while chairing that board, um, we went through a, a very difficult time, obviously, with school closure. And what happened with the school closure is we engaged the community. So in, in, in retrospect, the community made the decision. And so it made it real easy for board members around the table when we made the uh, decision on what schools that were actually going to be closed. So, um, and like I say, everybody around the table had the same vision. It was to deliver the best education possible. So that was a, quite a a great functioning board and uh, you know I have a board member here with me and it's it was a it was a pleasure to serve 
No, great. Yeah. You know, thank you for that. Some great insights there too. And and uh, one I, I might expand on. You were I think suggesting that often you you can with with some patience build a measure of consensus in your you community. Can. Yes. Um, yeah. And this again speaks to sort of the art of public participation. Um, and so regardless of the structure and the meeting formats you choose, that's going to be a really, really important consideration these next few years. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Lauren. Darren? Yeah, um, I guess for me, it's uh, my involvement with local sports has let me, uh, with the tennis club and the basketball, minor basketball and stuff, has let me do a health and wellness committee in the Waterford. And uh, as being meeting with that committee, uh, we brought many great things to the town, like a lot of new uh, recreational facilities, like a new turf soccer field and a basketball court, tennis court. And we're still meeting today to continue to upgrade our facilities and bring them to the, the best they can be. So that would be my best committee for the Health and Wellness Committee in New Waterford. Health and Wellness Committee in New Waterford. Great. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you for that. Um, and Kenny? Yes, Tom. <laughs> uh, for me, I guess it's, it started about four years ago when... Uh, a good friend of mine, we got together and uh, we, we decided we wanted to do something at uh, what was known then as the South Street uh, baseball field. Um, we formed a group called the Glace Bay Community, si uh, Community Commons Society. Uh, we wanted to get between six to eight members and we handpicked those members, uh, people we trusted in and we felt confident enough that they would be on board with this project. And our project was to... Uh, it turned the field into a multi-purpose facility. Uh, with COVID and whatnot, that, that sort of was at a standstill, but we were able to, uh, between all locals, all, all three levels of government, uh, to come up with about $350,000, which we, uh, we, we installed a splash pad, a uh, basketball court, and a state-of-the-art uh, playground facility. Um, to work with these, uh, these eight people was, uh, was amazing. Uh, everybody to be on the same page and to get out there and have the community to back this project was uh, was uh, was simply amazing and uh, mm -hmm. something we're very proud of. We're going to continue on that path and hopefully when things settle a little bit, uh, it would uh, we'll we'll continue on with the uh, the rest of the project. But having said that, uh, there's another great group I'm presently involved with, and uh, I, I I'd have to mention, and I'm sure the gentleman to my right. Is probably may touch on that, and that's Glace Bay Minor Hockey Association. As you know, um, we're led by uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, he's the president of our association, and uh, they do a bang up job. And pretty proud to be part of that group as well. Oh, great, no, great examples, and it kind of leads to a little bit of a footnote here that um, an option. There's always sort of the external option um, that. Where there's a, a problem or concern in the community, and council has done this in the past, it's it's sort of catalyzed the formation of a society or a group that's not actually a committee of the council, but where you do have some connection. Maybe it's through a little bit of, of funding or helping to recruit the citizen leaders. So I know that happened with Wentworth Park, even the New Aberdeen Revitalization Society. Council had a hand in that in the in the early days. Um, and that's another way of sort of causing good, positive community leaders to bubble up. Yeah, great. Thanks, Kenny. And James? Uh, thank you. Uh, and as uh, Kenny alluded to, I, I sit on and chair the uh, board of directors of uh, Glace Bay Minor Hockey Association. And uh, the uh, uh, committee uh, really uh, runs itself. Uh, uh, everybody has uh, defined roles, whether it's uh, the ice allocator or equipment or special events coordinator, whatever. But everybody uh, um, understands the role, uh, what's required, and they have the autonomy to go out and complete the task for the benefit of all. And um, uh, the, the uh, board functions very well. Uh, we meet uh, at least once a month. Uh, I'm sure we meet uh, informally uh, more than that, but certainly uh, the first Tuesday of every month we meet and everybody uh, defines or uh, informs the other board members uh, uh, what uh, took place in their uh, role for during the previous month. Excellent. It works very well. Excellent. And there's a kind of camaraderie there, I sense, a collegiality. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Steve? Thank you. I kind of chuckled when Lauren told the story because <laughs> first thing I put on the paper was school board 2012 to 16. 
and I'm not going to rehash what Lauren said, but the good thing about that is it's easy in, when you're elected to make good decisions in good times, but when you're faced with a $25 million less budget, uh, making those tough decisions, uh, that was hard, but we had a good plan, we engaged the community, uh, we had good rules of engagement, and we had a great relationship with senior staff, and at the end of the day, we made the decision, as tough as it was. But the only reflection on that is a year and a half later, all but two who decided not to run again were reelected. So there is some solace in making tough decisions, not worrying about getting reelected. Because at that point in time, the reelection coming up in 16 months wasn't even a thought. We knew we had a decision to make, and we made it. And I think from a political standpoint, if you make decisions when times are tough, you'll get respect because it's hard to make that tough decision. And we talked about a little bit earlier today about grandstanding potentially and speaking for the sake of speaking. You don't necessarily need to. It's what you do at the end of the day, and people will respect it. Uh -huh. So it's the, that exercise of sound judgment to sometimes make tough decisions. And in the long run, that's, that's what builds your credibility. Mm -hmm. yeah, OK, excellent. Thank you. And Glenn? Yeah, uh, mine would be uh, back to local sports. Uh, Pretty active myself right now, but uh, as a as a young hockey player, we played in a tournament called the uh, Challenge Cup, which was something that uh, was started here in Sydney. And with the question, what, what makes uh, what makes an organization great? It would definitely have to be the people that get involved with it, because most people, as you know, same as the people sitting around this table collectively, we have a vested interest in the, our community or in sports. So you tend to uh, you tend to want to go that extra mile and push it to uh, to make it great. <clears throat> and back to uh, another one, which I wasn't going to talk about, but I will, was uh, with, I also sit on the board with uh, Blizzard Hockey, which Mr. Edwards and Mr. Tracy know all about with, uh, with boards. That's a new board, but it's the same thing. You get people that come together. It's uh, a board for female hockey, so you get people that you want to give the girls the same, the same opportunity that the boys do. So I just wanted to touch on that. Excellent, excellent. And so your example and a number of the others also have uh, touched on a, a sort of like a selfless commitment on the part of the colleagues with whom you've served um, and w where there's a sense that these organizations are accomplishing something for the community. Uh, people almost lose track of the, 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 the time and the, the creativity that they're putting into the exercise. And with the time that people give up that sit on these boards yeah, too, as, as exactly. Mr. Edwards would know, running the Glace Bay Hockey, like it's, uh, sometimes it's a thankless, <laughs> it's a thankless job, but you do it because, because you enjoy it and you, it's for the betterment of everybody else. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, folks, I'm going to need about 30 to 40 minutes more of your time, and I'm just going to check in with you. We've been talking about taking breaks and not <laughs> getting into uh, marathon sessions that make us cranky. Um, do we need a time to stretch, a little bit of a break? Sure. Uh, yeah. Build a fire, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll take a pause for a few minutes, um, and uh, and we'll re-energize. So I'm not the only one. Then. No, uh, I yeah. freeze. <laughs> That's why I kept my. Okay, but, uh, yeah, I'm getting my coat. Oh, me too. Yeah. <laughs>
This, uh, this next exercise maybe we'll just do as a written exercise. Um, and, uh, but, <laughs> but please tell me about a bad committee experience. Uh, you don't have to name the organization. Uh, but this, this will be useful information, actually, in writing the memo that will follow this meeting. So please tell me about a bad uh, committee experience. What made it a bad committee experience? <laughs> what made you yeah. dread those meetings? Are we writing or are we just speaking on it? We're writing. <laughs> We're writing. Yep. That's an easy one. <laughs> yeah. For some folks, that's an e that is an easier question to answer than the previous one. Ninety seconds. And again, we'll understand the term committee to broadly here. We'll understand the term broadly, so it could be a board, a council. Thirty seconds. Okay, so as promised, I won't put anyone on the spot, but would anyone like to share your bad committee experience? Amanda. Okay, so this relates to council, but not really. But um, <laughs> no, I, I served on um, what I called the garbage committee, the solid waste regional chairs committee, and the reason the committee itself was wonderful, but the way that it was formed and the structure and the reporting, um, so it was formed by the province. To, in my eyes, now reflecting on it, it was the whole purpose was for the province to look like they had a committee doing this work and they would de designate us and task us with these things like go and, and do the really hard work of, of coming up with an extended producer responsibility for a printed paper and packaging framework, um, go consult businesses and municipalities on this, do, um, do a, an entire study on the efficiency of solid waste management throughout the province and, and we will come back with you know some really good legislation to implement the recommendations you've come up with, and then they don't, because the committee has no teeth or no authority or no power to implement the yes. work that they do. And that is horrible. That is a horrible feeling as a committee member. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And writ large, uh, our community, unfortunately, has a spectacular case study of that uh, in the form of the JAG process. Right? <laughs> Unclear mandate. They thought they were being granted responsibility, but actually weren't. 
um, overlapping committees, uh, almost almost like the case study of how not to set up a, a committee structure, right? Yeah, and um, the Beaton Institute, by the way, has at CBU has the archives of the JAG, and it is just a fascinating insight in how you can bring together well mean many well-meaning citizens, um, but how a process can. Uh, exhaust everyone and make everyone almost cynical about community participation if you don't get some of the like the starting points right uh, clarifying what is it, what are the powers what you're asking of this group um, who does what who reports to whom none of that was actually clear at the start if you look at the records of the JAG okay um, that's great, great insights there. Uh, any, did anyone else want to share a, a negative experience? Uh, James? Well, uh, similar to the, uh, to, to the positive experience, uh, when you have the, uh, uh, the right people in the right places all going in the same direction, the same is true on the other side. Uh, it, it's to, to do with uh, personnel, with uh, attitude. If you have the wrong person in, uh, uh, or, or wrong person or people in, in uh, a certain committee with where perhaps everybody isn't going in the same direction and uh, you have a combative attitude that makes for uh, a long night as well yes yes or a, a long session pardon me yes yeah. Yeah, excellent point um steve and then kenny yeah, when i looked at this question i looked at it from a broad perspective there's boards where you're paid and there's boards where you're depending on volunteers the level of commitment by the volunteers will reflect on the success of your committee. Uh, is it reasonable to expect everybody's going to give the same effort? It's tough. Uh, things don't get done. There's lack of vision. Uh, you're not measuring because think goals aren't being met. Whereas when you're on a paid committee, of course, the responsibility of you, either as an elected person or you're, you're, you're receiving a stipend, then you take on a responsibility a little bit different, where you are holding yourself accountable, hopefully, to engage to do what tasks you're, 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 you're asked to do. So I think there's a difference between a volunteer committee versus a uh, remuneration type of committee. And I think both have various degrees of success. Right. Would you agree, though, Steve, that if the uh, council decides to engage volunteers to a significant degree on committees, um, and the committees would presumably have some mandate letters or clear purposes, uh, that it would be totally reasonable to have uh, a kind of job description, uh, a kind of mandate to the volunteers. So uh, even though they are doing this pro bono. Well, I, we, yeah. I'll give yeah. an example. We just put out uh, through the paper for citizens to join our committees. Yeah. Of course, that includes a resume. We want to see where you're coming from, what your experience have, and people volunteer for a reason. They want to give back, whether it's a volunteer position or a paid position. And I think uh, you want people with, with vision who want to give back. So I think you, you need to vet that. Because some people get on committees for personal gain, whereas your son's going to make AAA because you're on the executive. Right. And we've all been through that. Right. That's the wrong reason to join a committee. Right. And then be very clear with your expectations and of them once, once they're identified, appointed. It needs no. to be addressed, right? Right. OK, excellent. Excellent. Um, did anyone else want to share a negative committee experience? Uh, th this is valuable information. I certainly will collect the uh, the sheets. Uh, go ahead, Kenny. Okay. Sorry, I missed you. Sorry about that. Sorry. Similar to uh, Steve, I believe uh, any committee starts at the top, and you need leadership. And that leadership, uh, to me, has to show the passion for what we're involved with. And uh, if you don't, you don't show that, then I believe uh, your committee members will feed off of that negativi negativity, or if it's positive, then uh, they'll bring that positive attitude to the table. But too many times, not too many times, but some of the committees I've been involved with, their leadership wasn't great. Uh, there was hidden agendas, uh, things like that there. So in poor attendance, some people just right. sort of give up on it. So right. I believe it starts at the top. And right, a tone at the top. We Servant leadership is another term. Um, just uh, the fact that we see our chair or the, the leader of our committee, uh, just, just trying to go the extra kilometer um, and showing a kind of humility uh, in the role. Uh, that's, that's powerful in ways we can't always measure. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, uh, Eldon? Uh, thanks very much, Tom. Um, at first, when you 
put the uh, pose the question forward, I was having trouble trying to figure out what to say because all committee experiences pretty much have, in my lifetime, have been a positive one. But um, there was a committee that I was involved in a number of years ago uh, that was a hostile takeover uh, and involved uh, a great deal of pain and suffering for a lot of people, uh, people that wanted to have an industry deregulated and thought that they were going to take us over and, and have the provincial government disband us. Right. Uh, fortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, but it was a very, very trying time. Uh, that's probably getting close to 20 years ago. Uh, but uh, that would be probably the one only the one that came to my mind. And it was uh, hostile takeover is the only way that I could put it. So Right. Sometimes dealing with those external challenges, external forces. Yeah, that's a good insight yeah. uh, for sure. Thank you. Great. No, thanks. Thanks to everyone for sharing that. And again, I will collect uh, all of the sheets at the end to help with the with the memo. So I'd like to ask you to reflect on this question now. Okay, what committee would you be excited to join? And don't feel too constrained by this question. We're not necessarily talking about existing municipal committees. Um, we may be talking about something that hasn't even been formed. Uh, but this is going to give me sort of some, some insight about where some of your passions are. Um, and that, that will help in making recommendations. Okay, so what committee would you be excited to join? Either an actual committee within the municipality or outside the municipality, or one that doesn't exist but that you wished were in place? Okay, so I'll give maybe, let's say a minute and a half for you to um, write down the name of a committee, actual or hypothetical, that you would be excited to join, and, and maybe just a, a few words on why. this is giving me insights not just about what committees there ought to be or what their terms of reference ought to be but what kinds of meetings you value um, and so that will be helpful for the discussion about just the way council itself as a body is structured how it meets how it organizes its agenda its frequency and so on Say 15 more seconds. <coughs> Just a heads up, this time we'll start in the middle of the room. <laughs> okay, so I would uh, appreciate hearing from everyone on this. And we'll start with Amanda. What committee would you be excited to join? I feel like <clears throat> when we did speak about delegations and presentations to council, it would be neat to have um, a separate committee altogether that was dedicated to, say, once a month having communities or community organizations and, you know, 
folks that are doing their own initiatives perhaps come in and speak to council on what's happening on the ground. So we as elected officials obviously are really connected to, we like to think, you know, everything that's happening in our communities, but <coughs> sometimes it's more meaningful when it's coming, I guess you could say from the horse's mouth. So having a committee where folks can sign up to present once a month type thing and just inform um, the wider council on what's happening, maybe some barriers they're facing, or even just to share some good news is really, really helpful to kind of keeping relevant and on top of what's happening in our respective communities. Okay, no, this is great. Okay, um, well, duly noted. Uh, and we'll go to Lauren. I, um, I'd, I'd like to see a committee, well, I, I would like to work on a committee that works for the betterment of, uh, of the lower representative or the underrepresented in our communities, because often the they're in the background and, and not represented and not have a voice. Um, you know, we can often say that, you know, we, we want to help, um, but if we don't know what we're looking to help or who we're looking to help, um, you know, how do we do that? So I think that the underrepresented um, individuals in the community, whether it be groups, marginalized uh, citizens, or even our seniors, our seniors are often, um, you know, overlooked because we, we don't we don't think of seniors often because they're you know they've done what they needed to do and often they're not uh, contributing people think to society or or to communities but I think you know we need to for me it, it's to to be mindful of the people that aren't being represented on the on the mainstream or the broad broader picture um, and make sure that their voice is heard. Okay, whose voice isn't being heard and then Correct. yeah really sort of building a bit of a process or structure around yes. that. Okay, excellent, excellent. Darren? Okay, uh, the committee I'm uh, gonna talk about is, it is not in existence right now. It would be a green committee, not after Lauren Green, just a, <laughs> a green committee, like a, maybe Why like, <laughs> well maybe after Lauren, maybe like solar power, like a, I've been talking to some contractors, they have some great ideas, like a solar powered sidewalks that could like a power our, our street lights and stuff like that. Like I'd like to see a little bit more of that, maybe brought to the forefront here in the CVRM, solar panel, green energy, that kind of stuff. Right, right. Um, and the uh, actually the case studies we quickly looked at they do have something similar I think in each case yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. okay Kenny yeah thanks Tom for me I guess uh, when I decided uh, that I, this is what I wanted to do to get involved in uh, municipal politics I, I, I thought of uh, the district uh, first the constituents in it uh, not just District 9 but all of Glace Bay and uh, mm -hmm. I put that at the forefront. Um, I, uh, you know, love to get involved with the local uh, nonprofit groups, and probably one most recently, the Glace Bay, Glace Bay Revitalization Group, and that's a young, a young family group that are interested in turning things around in, in Glace Bay, and putting a positive, positive spin on, uh, on a lot of things in Glace Bay. So, for me, uh, these are the types of groups that uh, I really like to. Um, get involved with and, uh, you know, make a difference within the community. Okay. As a whole, as a council, uh, I realize that there's, there's a lot more at stake here and, uh, you know, I'm excited to be part of that, uh, part, of, part of the council to, uh, to move forward and make sure that things that, uh, that are going on in CBRM, uh, just to put a positive spin on things and, and make and do the right things. Okay, great. And, and that uh, theme of neighborhood revitalization, yeah. Yeah, sort of grassroots leadership, okay, excellent. Uh, James? Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, I was excited by the uh, question as well. When I uh, started writing, things started popping in my mind, and uh, I've got uh, uh, several examples here, but um, uh, I'm involved in several committees now, so, uh, but uh, along with uh, Lauren and uh, Kenny there, I, I think the marginalized groups uh, for example, the uh, children, the seniors, the youth, uh, homeless, uh, um, I think there'd be a, a, a need to, um, uh, for a committee to uh, review how we can uh, uh, take care of uh, uh, or, or do what we can uh, for uh, the uh, groups. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, I've been involved uh, in the, since I've been elected uh, with uh, uh, tourism uh, groups and um, I'm very excited to be uh, included in, in those committees and with the potential uh, on the eastern side of the island and certainly in District 8 that I represent, it's just uh, unlimited. Uh, and I had a, 
Uh, another note, uh, uh, a good friend of mine will be happy for me to uh, say that uh, if we were to strike some kind of a committee for uh, our uh, fishing industry as well, I think that would be interesting. Um, and then the other, my last uh, note was uh, I'd like to sit on the uh, police committee and then I, I reminded myself that I am on that one, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks so much, James. And Steve? Thanks, Tom. Uh, the committee that I would like to be excited to be joined is the Seniors Engagement Committee. Uh, as you know, I work in Escazoni. Council is forever referring to elders. Why? Wisdom, experience, reality of today, what they're facing. Uh, we're billing at a $25 million long-term care facility. The first thing we did was engage with the people who are going to live there. And, and from that information and knowledge was a part of our ask and business case. So seniors play a very important role. In CBRN, there's a very large percentage of our population, our seniors, who certainly have uh, every right to share in what they think. And I think uh, engaging with our seniors will certainly be beneficial for this council. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Excellent point. Uh, Glenn. Uh, the committee that, uh, I, I don't know if it exists per se, but uh, a focus group committee, which would touch on a lot of the, uh, a lot of the aspects of what these, my counselors here are saying, uh, fisheries, seniors, those that uh, disenfranchised, so that maybe there's a, a, a committee that you could form that could deal with different issues in an informal environment just so that you could figure out solutions for these things, have conversations with the general public to involve them in that informal setting so it's not so structured so people could speak freely. Okay, okay, right. Or you, uh, this sort of idea, very time limited, if you have a particular question you need a working group to answer, you send them out and they come back. And they come back with yeah. some, some, for, some yeah. sort of answer. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. Thanks, Glenn. And we'll go to Gordon. Thanks, Tom. Um, for me, uh, as a, a health and safety advocate, I was <clears throat> very glad that I was uh, nominated and taken on the role with the Cape Breton Regional Municipality Fire Services Committee, <clears throat> um, but you know, which is a good committee. But something that I would like to see, and I think some of the other uh, councillors echoed some of this, is a I'd like to see a a, a committee formed, uh, like a health and safety committee formed, that can advocate uh, to the provinces and the federal governments. Uh, around our social issues, uh, as you know, as I reiterated before, issues around our, our child poverty, our homelessness, uh, and especially uh, addiction and mental health services. You know, we need <clears throat> we need to be able to advocate uh, at this level um, with our communities to get them engaged in, on those issues. And I believe, in in order for these kind of things to take take a, take take uh, take flight, is uh, it has to come from the community and has to come from the pressures of the community through the regional council to our other provincial and federal counterparts. So I'd like to see a committee, committee that would be formed that can advocate for those people. Okay, so this theme has come up again, sort of the, the role of council as an advocate and uh, just sort of giving the council the tools it needs to be an effective advocate um, to sort of get either sort of the funding or the programs that the community needs to be healthy. Well, in my short tenure as a councillor, I realize that we don't have a whole lot of clout here as, as councillor. <laughs> I see we don't; our hands are tied, uh, bound by the province uh, in those uh, in those ways. And and I think uh, as a, as a grassroots uh, uh, governance, and I believe that's where we should be as a grassroots government governance. And we're here to represent the people. More we, we see more people than our provincial or federal counterparts. If, if anybody wants to make a call, they call the councillor first. It seems to be anyway. And uh, we direct them in, in, in those to where the, the, they should be uh, making those calls. And, and I believe uh, to have a community organization, community group, to advocate for, 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 for our social issues, I think would go a long way. And uh, I believe as councillors in this level, I believe this government should be supporting those kind of uh, um, initiatives and, uh, you know, to be able to press our, our other governance to, to, uh, to accountability. So this idea that you have a voice and how do you sort of strengthen that voice? Yes. Yeah, yeah. okay, excellent, excellent. Uh, Erlene. Um, mine's not as grand. Um, I would like to be part of a committee, which a lot of these certainly do exist in some form, but I'm not sure 
if it would be from a larger perspective, but I want to engage people in communities in a committee that's something, it's, you're almost going to experience instant gratification. So when you go there, you know I'm going to see a benefit of it. And I look at, and I compare it to, similar to the town of Anaganish. They have a, a, a beautification and land rehabilitation kind of committee. And, and when I say that, it's, it's more or less the idea behind it. Yeah, would I like to say that once every two months we as a committee go out and strap on some safety vests and grab some garbage bags and pick up litter? Absolutely, that would be part of it. But I think a bigger part of it is, I know, for example, I went on a rant lately about litter in my neighborhood, about tags going on. Well, I happen to know for a fact that there's certain things in the justice system that there are people that are available to remove that tag off a building, providing the owner of the building can supply the supplies and this agreement is met. Well, there's a whole bunch of little networks that if you want to see something like that happen, there, there are kids, and as a mother of four, that we're not angels and I have no, you know, probation happens. And I've had kids that had to <laughs> fill in some time that literally had nothing to do because there wasn't enough opportunity. Well, we live on the north side. There's spray paint everywhere. There's garbage everywhere. My kids could have got ours very easily. Is this something we could incorporate? Or it's, it's you know, people that need for a resume or for some kind of, of, of education assistance that they need so much volunteer work. Like, if we had a committee that right on ground route could bring all these networks together for something that literally every week you're watching your community get better, and it doesn't have to be big to be better. Yeah. It just gets better, and that's that's what I would like to see. Okay, and there's that low-hanging fruit concept again. Um, the the community leagues case study is kind of in the same framework, right? It's tangible. It's go after w some wins. Uh, Just really stop making excuses. And involve your local place. leaders. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, fix it. Yeah. Fix the small things and fix yeah. them quickly. Clean it up. Clean it yes. up. Yeah, clean exactly. It up. Yeah. And then we can go after the big stuff, but yeah. clean it up. Yeah. Yeah, and that has a psychological impact too. I mean, this has actually been studied, right? The, the clean it up principle, um, where I can tell you that from yeah. my house. If yeah. I take a weekend to myself and don't clean, I'm miserable on Sunday night. If I spend one day being yeah. miserable and clean it up, I feel fantastic. So I act, I get the concept, and yeah. we all need to. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks, Raleen. Steve. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, I think one of the most important committees that we can have is the reelect Raleen McMullen committee. <laughs> Um, did I read that right? Yeah. Is that okay? Good. Uh, yeah. Um, communication strategy. I have said for a number of years now that CBRM does an okay job of communicating with its public, but could do a much better job. Um, a lot of of the uh, departments in our CBRM have a communications person. Sometimes the communications person is very good at what they do. In other times, it was a file handed to them because somebody else did it before and that person's gone and now it's yours. Mm -hmm. I would like to see a strategy for our communications, not only the messages we put out, mm -hmm. but the advertising that we spend, uh, the medians that we use, and the messages, how the messages are put out and when. Uh, I'd like to see a department, a communications department, and have all these people that are in communications and other departments now funnel under one individual and have that person uh, oversee how our messaging is put out, where it's put out, and um, in to what degree. Okay, and in terms of your role, Steve, uh, so just uh, sort of going back to the question four, um, would, where would you sort of see yourself uh, being a part of that? I've been in the marketing and advertising business for 31 years. Um, I have adapted to some incredible changes over that 31 year period. And I believe that as somebody that's been in that business for a long time, that I could have an impact, um, even if it's just to, at a board level where it's suggestions. Right. Um, not necessarily because I'm the best at it, only because I've been doing it for a long time. And I think that there are, are definitely some people that CBRM now employs 
that have the capability of doing it better than me. Right. So what I've seen some organizations do is form a working group on communications, because this uh, this concern that you expressed is quite general. Are we using modern methods? Are we reaching the people we want to? How, how is our messaging actually perceived? Uh, who's doing the communications for us? Um, and so sometimes large organizations will form a working group. Uh, and again, time limited. Come back in 90 days and uh, just do a little bit of an appraisal of how we could uh, use some of our resources better. Um, so that's that's a hypothetical possibility. Yep. Thank you. Great. And Eldon? Thanks very much, Tom. Um, I guess uh, for me, I'm excited about uh, a committee that uh, we just had our first meeting last week, but it's, it's kind of just a restructuring of an existing committee, and that would be the United Way Fundraising Committee for Reduction in Poverty. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a gala event for five years uh, with a goal of approximately $500,000 being raised over that time period and ended up raising about approximately 1.2 million. So that was an exciting five years, uh, and uh, COVID has changed things. Uh, we have to restructure and reassess how we do fundraisers, and uh, we're uh, in the process just last week of starting that new committee and a new process of how we're going to try to move forward to continue to raise uh, some money for that uh, particular cause. So um, I'm excited to see how we're going to evolve with that because COVID has changed the way we do everything. So. Right, right. And there are many examples of municipalities working very well with their United Ways. So United Way is not a committee of the municipality, but it's definitely a partner, uh, a collaborator. Um, so uh, some of the uh, very pressing concerns that Gordon uh, raised, uh, again, subject of dialogue with, uh, with the United Way. Some communities have, some municipalities have sort of inspired the formation of a community foundation to take on things that the United Way can't take on and to almost like build an endowment. There's a way for people to leave their money and their will to their community. How does one do that now? If I want to leave my, my estate to the CBRM, um, is there a receptacle for that? And in some places, that's a community foundation. Uh, with its own board, uh, with an investment strategy to make sure that endowment keeps growing, and then strategic investments, so in demonstration projects that can really show how we can get at some of the social challenges in our community. Okay, um, these, were, these were really great insights. I, I appreciate that very, very much. And again, I'll be collecting those sheets. But now, I'd like to reflect together about some emerging themes in our discussion. So we're reflecting on some strategies to make the work of council effective, uh, enjoyable, satisfying, impactful for the community. You all expressed um, you know, some ambitions for the next four years, that this community will be different in a positive way in four years because of your leadership. Now somehow we have to translate that into some, some tips and strategies for the operations of council itself and for the committees and the committee structure. So as mentioned at the outset, I will write a memo, it will be a short memo uh, this week and just in the next few days, but I want to try to summarize some of the themes I've been hearing in the responses. And I'm going to miss some and I'm going to invite you to add some words or little phrases that should be on my radar as I work on that memo for you. Um, so I heard, um, in one form or another, that whatever we do in the way we set up, the way you set up your council meetings and the committees, um, it's got to be purposeful. It's not just transactional. It has to be purposeful. I heard that it has to be transparent. Um, it has to be community oriented. A lot of interesting grassroots examples came up here, and I really came to appreciate how satisfying the grassroots achievements are for you and how much energy you get from those. Um, so how can you bring that experience now to really uh, continue to pump positive energy into, into the council? It's got to be ethical, has to be compassionate. Um, I heard that it has to be top, it has to sort of promote excellence in areas of core responsibility. So despite limited resources, you want sort of your governing work and the way you do your business to really acknowledge excellence in areas of core responsibility uh, because that's then going to give CBRM credibility as an advocate um, for including 
for funds and issues where you might not have direct responsibility, but where your residents are expecting you to show solidarity. Um, I heard, uh, again, the importance of advocacy. I heard the importance of managing scheduling and being respectful to staff, uh, not just in terms of scheduling, uh, because there's a, there's a sort of a small secretariat to make all this happen, uh, but also just in terms of the, the professional rapport with staff, uh, understanding the, their administrative expertise, that understanding the role of council and counselors vis-a-vis -vis staff, it's, it's an overlapping role, but it's a different role as well. Um, so being able to respect that uh, it was identified as, as uh, very important. Um, let's see. Um, partnerships. Um, so the idea that you could farm out some of the work, not to committees of yours, but to partners of yours, uh, that that came up as well. And sometimes that may even be inspiring the creation of a partner. Um, so helping to set up a society which can then sort of stand on its own, but work very, very closely with you. I actually gave an interesting example with the New Aberdeen Revitalization Society. And that was a creative move on the part of CBRM because now you have a group of community leaders who are, who are making a difference in their neighborhood. Um, but they're also able to do some things that the municipality can't do. Um, so for example, the municipality, um, if it wants to put a vacant derelict property back into service, uh, it has to sell that, if it's a private owner, it has to sell that at the assessed value, I guess. Uh, it can't say, well, take it for a dollar. We're happy to put it back on the tax rolls just as long as you develop it. Actually, the municipality legally can't do that. But your partner, the New Aberdeen Revitalization Society, can do that and has done it. Um, so there are, there are creative ways to do what you want to do working with partners. Um, so I heard some examples that involved uh, partners, not necessarily committees. Um, are there any other words or phrases that you heard that I really should remember and come back to as I work on this memo for you. Unity. Unity, yes. Empowerment. Uh, yes, yes. People who don't have a voice in the community, how does this process give them a voice? Right. Absolutely, that unity and empowerment, excellent. Excellent. Leadership okay. through optimism. It's yeah. Easy, easy to be negative and optimistic. Okay. Our okay. glass is always half full, not half empty. Right. Okay. Optimism, um, leadership through optimism, positive energy. Right. That's infectious too. Professionalism too. Professionalism. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, really important. We have to have some standards. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Measurable and tangible goals. Okay, measurable and tangible goals. So you may not reach the finish line, but you're able to measure and check off where you've been as right. opposed to having this grand scheme and no real accountability in the middle. Right. So something that is... You have your deliverables. Able to tag. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's where these mandate letters come in too. You have a committee, not just to have a committee. You want... They're accountable back to you to actually get something done. And your volunteers are accountable to you. Um, even though we appreciate them uh, beyond words for their time, but they're still accountable. It's still a kind of job that they're doing when they commit to help the CBRM. Okay, now this is, this is really valuable. Um, uh, just on the, on the point of professionalism, I just have to say how, how encouraged I am, even just through this discussion and what I've witnessed so far, just sort of the way you relate to each other um, and just the, the, the kindness and understanding and listening that's around this, this horseshoe, that's really encouraging. Right? And not every council, if you look across the country or anywhere, uh, has that. Um, so seize the moment. Uh, yes, there are different perspectives and you represent different uh, communities within the municipality. You will disagree. You won't always have unanimous votes, but the respect is here and uh, don't lose it. That's wonderful. Okay, um, any other words or phrases that I missed? Okay, let's go to this. So please share now, if we're getting close to the end of today, um, please share a final insight. So as I write a memo to you this week on committees, committee effectiveness and meetings, including council meetings, 
Uh, what is one thing you want me to keep in mind? Okay, so maybe I'll give one minute just to reflect and, and write down as well, because again, I'll collect the sheets. So essentially what I'm going to do is take a first crack based on what I heard from you and what I read on your sheets, based on your guidance and experience, take a first crack at making some recommendations for council meetings, committee structure, committee mandates. And so now I'm asking you to just give me a final insight for today about something that should not fall off the radar. Time management. The too few committees go too long in the meetings. Too many com committees spread people out too far. You know, there, there is 12 of us, but if we end up with 20 different committees to try and, you know, and we're all on a couple of yep. them and yep. you're trying to concentrate on your other duties and, you also still want to have the ability as a council member, and I'm not talking as far as like liaison members or community committees, but as a council, you still want to have that opportunity and time to be, you know, to show initiative and, and, and to be forward thinking and to bring things forward outside of all these other regulatory mandates. So right. it's just and a lot of, and this is in itself is going to cause controversy, but many of us have other things in our lives, whether it's family commitments, whether it's other occupational commitments, whether it's other volunteer commitments. And I just want to see that whatever is decided is best utilized and not spreading people too far or spreading things out too much so that everything is so in particular, like if that makes any sense. Right. So there is a real time management issue here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is a problem. You see that in many municipalities. I mean, you've seen that here, too. Uh, elected people running haggard <laughs> between meetings, overlapping committees that they're on. Yeah. The vast majority yeah. of us will probably want to attend most committees or be a member. Like, when we had our, our, our committee. Yeah. <laughs> That's your historical experience. That's right. Even yeah. when you had so the planning advisory committee, the other councillors came. Yeah. And we yeah. spread ourselves like yeah. we spread each other too thin, you know. So it's, it's just important to keep that in mind. Yeah. Excellent point. Okay, so time management. Um, other uh, final insights, Amanda. Um, so I I'm glad that you talked about, you know, how y how you've received the conversations from our from all of the councillors around the table, um, because I think the consensus in some at some points is that these committees and the work that we do at council is very important and it has a direct impact on our community. So the better we work together and the better we find, like the better ways that we find to do this work, the better the impact on our communities. So I'm, I'm glad that people have taken this exercise so far very seriously and thoughtfully because what we do in here does have that direct impact. So I'm, I'm eager to see how this hap rolls out in four years for sure. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, so other um, sort of final insights, things to keep on the radar, uh, James? Teamwork. Teamwork, yep, yep. Excellent word. Mm -hmm. Steve? Uh, in terms of our next steps, when we talk about our strategies going forward, your strategies would be a reflection of your committees, right? Don't take on too much. The old saying is 
don't chew off too much. You can't, can't, trying to do a lot, you don't achieve anything. So when we talk about our strategies, smart goals, short-term goals, long-term goals, it's a mixture of both. But if you set yourself up to fail and you don't put the commitment into it, you will probably end up failing. Right. So when we do our strategy, let's strategize in reality, take short-term goals and, and make them reality, it be it two years or four years. Right. You know, it's, it's a good point. So uh, even if you come up with eventually high-level strategic directions, translate them into deliverables, short-term deliverables, uh, as quickly as you Which can. Which is a reflection yeah. of your committees. Yeah. Because that's just going to do the work. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So other insights? I think it's important how we express our leadership and how the community sees us as leaders and what role we take on and how we, <clears throat> how, how when we sit in these committees, how we as leaders um, um, work with these committees. So and I think it's important that, you know, as in the leadership role, to be elected to this role, I think showing the people that elected you and the others in the community that you are willing to take on that role and be a leader, I think uh, a lot of people fall in place and, and are willing to jump up and, and take part at that point in time. Right, right. Um, that's that's very true. Like, if you uh, establish that um, cre uh, credibility of service, of public service, uh, which I know all of you have done and are doing, um, it becomes so much easier to reach out to your community and and to particular people even. Just say, we need your help. Uh, can you give some time uh, to a project or a committee um, or a session uh, that we need to put together? Absolutely, and often that is how people are recruited, as you know, it's sort of the direct ask. Um, sometimes the people who are asked are, are modest, but when persuaded, turn out to be incredible leaders. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any other insights? Okay, so I have a, I actually have a lot of information, and in, when I get to actually read uh, what you wrote on your sheets, it will be even more helpful. Um, so is, is everyone okay with that, that I will take a few days um, and come up with a, with a short memo, almost like a discussion paper, but a really short one, that will put some, some ideas and options forward uh, around effective council meetings, around committee structure, committee mandates, um, and then maybe through Doodlepole, we, uh, we could reconvene and just spend some time with that memo. Uh, it may be off base in some places, but at least it'll give you something to react to and to build on. Uh, does that sound okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think uh, uh, my, uh, my uh, duty is done for today. Uh, happy to continue the conversation though uh, through the week uh, when working on the memo. And, um, and if you could just write your name on the sheet so I can reach out to you if I don't understand something that uh, I read on the sheets, that would be wonderful. Uh, but it's really a pleasure uh, working with you, and I just want to wish you uh, the very best, and I'm looking forward to the next step. Thank you. So, Tom, I just, on behalf of our council, want to thank you once again for offering your time and your expertise and, and helping guide us through this. I, I, I feel like instead of having one session where we rush through things or spend a lot of time, which is exactly the opposite of clearly what any of us want here. We want to do things in a meaningful manner, and you're really helping us do that. So just thank you so kindly again.